Getting that? Cinnamet, the very drug used to treat Parkinson's, is a mitochondrial toxin, which is at the cornerstone of the disease. Well, why doesn't everybody then who has uh, these issues uh, or who is exposed to these toxins get it? Could there be some issue where they have a genetic predisposition like we talked about? And interestingly, if you happen to um, inherit this CYP2D6, which is a liver detoxification enzyme flaw, if you inherit this flaw, your risk for Parkinson's goes up 240%. So we wouldn't want to have, you don't want to have this enzyme flaw nor would you want to be exposed to any environmental toxin, perhaps, that could downregulate the way your CYP2D6 system works. And here are some environmental toxins that can actually inhibit CYP2D6. We know that the bottom line is when you have this enzymatic dysfunction, that what happens is you don't sulfate. You don't break down chemicals appropriately. And uh, if you don't uh, do this process called sulfation, which is part of phase two detoxification, you're at risk for Alzheimer's, you're at risk for uh, Lou Gehrig's disease or ALS, and you're at risk for uh, Parkinson's as well. As well, so you can actually um, the correlations between pesticide exposure and ALS are very real. Uh, we now know, of course, that other toxins like jet fuel, for, for example, which is very suspicious, or other things that may have gone on like multiple immunizations and then exposures to toxins like in the Gulf War uh, individuals whose risk for Lou Gehrig's disease is astronomical. You only have to have one of those patients come to see you and die till you really start to understand how important what's going on around us is and how people's heads are buried in the sand when we don't want to recognize how important these environmental influences are in causing these devastating neurological problems. What I'm saying to you is that we are causing these diseases, that these are caused by what's going on in our environments. And, you know, far beyond the clinical laboratory or the compounding pharmacy, we have to take steps to really work on raising public awareness as to how dangerous these pesticides are. If you follow the stock market last week, there was a lot of information about how well um, the various big box purveyors of organic foods are, are doing because people are really becoming interested in this. This information is getting out. Um, why is this activity of sulfation so important? Because it changes so many drugs and xenobiotics and makes them less dangerous. So I'm a neurologist, and yet what we're looking at right this moment is the way that the liver works to detoxify because that plays a pivotal role in your risk for neurodegenerative diseases. And it's so unfortunate that when I lecture to neurologists, they don't really recognize anything kind of south of the foramen magnum as playing any role in neurologic diseases. And yet, fundamentally, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ALS are indicated uh, as flaws of hepatic detoxification. And guess what? The brain has a detoxification uh, activity as well. So we're not talking about people who have determined risk or going to have Alzheimer's or Parkinson, but rather a predisposition where once they inherit this gene or damage or have ge different genetic expression, then when they're exposed, uh, they have a different outcome. As um, if I can I go back? Can I go back one slide? Are you able to do that, Mark? Good. I mean, these are identical twins, but yet had uh, somewhat of a different environmental experience. So their morphology uh, it becomes different. And here is an individual who developed Parkinson's disease um, because of an uh, event that occurred during his life that modified his genetic expression, Muhammad Ali on the left of the screen. So this is an important rule of heredity. Always. This, is, this plays out very well in our house, too, because whenever there's a problem, I always say, well, it didn't come from my side of the family. <laughs> you can actually test hepatic detoxification. We do it all the time. And um, there, as a matter of fact, Great Smokies Diagnostic Lab offers a hepatic detoxification profile. What a great thing to learn about your patient. How well does he or she handle detoxification? And why would you want to know that? Because there's plenty that you can do about it. The formation of reactive oxygen species turns on these cells as well. We have to understand this concept of excitotoxicity. Energy linked, because it deals with mitochondria, excitotoxic, where excitotoxic chemicals damage the mi mitochondria. 
Well, here's a little bit. This is a neuron, and there you see the mitochondria producing ATP. And you have this thing called the NMDA receptor, which um, when it's, everything's happy, when the mitochondria are working, the NMDA receptor deals with memory, deals with plasticity, allows the neuron to function well. There's a channel in the NMDA receptor blocked with magnesium such that when glutamate binds to that receptor, it changes the, the, the uh, neuron a little bit, allows it to function. And this is when there's normal electrochemical gradient, where there's normal um, mitochondria working and the difference in electromagnetic potential between inside and outside of the neuron is normal. But when the mitochondria are not working very well, that gradient changes, and you'll notice that the magnesium block in that purple-colored channel has gone away. And when that happens and glutamate binds to that receptor and the magnesium goes away, we have an influx of calcium. Now, this is very fundamental. In other words, mitochondrial dysfunction allows calcium influx. With me? Through the NMDA receptor. And that's not a good thing, that calcium comes in. Calcium is mopped up by the mitochondria. And in the process of doing that, more free radicals are produced, which damage the mitochondria further, less ATP, more calcium influx. So it's called a feed-forward cycle. So here's glutamate binding to the NMDA receptor. If you said NMDA real fast a few times, how would it sound? Namenda, right? <laughs> what do you know? This is where Namenda works, or Memantine. I'm not big on drugs, but I, I happen to think that <coughs> understanding this uh, biochemistry makes me uh, very fond of Namenda uh, in many neurodegenerative conditions. The bottom line is that this calcium influx increases reactive oxygen species formation. Mitochondrial dysfunction from any cause decreases ATP production. We're all familiar with that. But the downside of that is it leads to the changes in the depolarization, which allows this persistent NMDA receptor activation by glutamate. And this leads to calcium influx, which does what? Leads to mitochondrial dysfunction. I could draw an arrow right back to the top. Simply stated then, because of this relationship with um, uh, reactive oxygen species and cytokine production, turning on the microglia, this is the relationship between mitochondrial dysfunction and brain inflammation. So anything that damages the mitochondria will lead to increased brain inflammation. And there are so many things that are out there that can damage the mitochondria, that can affect the, effect, the way that mitochondria work. And the good news is we can target mitochondrial function wonderfully. The downside then of this oxidative damage of the mitochondria is that it, on the bottom there, it increases reactive oxygen species formation. And this becomes a feed-forward cycle. Because mitochondria are exquisitely sensitive to that environment when there's a lot of free radicals around. Because mitochondrial DNA doesn't have the protective histones like nuclear DNA. So its ability to uh, protect itself is diminished. And mitochondrial repair is about one-tenth as great as nuclear DNA repair. So, and, and unfortunately, the DNA is located right next to the mitochondrial membrane, which is where electron transport takes place. And that's why when those people got that uh, MPTP injection 12 years before, that set the stage for this mitochondrial dysfunction. And slowly but surely, these neurons degenerated. So mitochondrial DNA damage, again, as mentioned, it's tenfold higher than nuclear DNA. And the mutation rate of mitochondrial DNA is much higher as well. Um, it's located on the inner mitochondrial membrane, and that's where these free radicals are produced in the first place. The DNA is parked right next to where uh, the reactive oxygen species happen, and again, they lack these histones. Well, let's look at mitochondrial damage and recognize that the susceptibility of your mitochondria to being damaged varies based upon your APOE profile. Now, you can have APOE 2, 3, or 4. The one that is associated with profound risk of Alzheimer's is APOE4. The problem being that uh, APOE4 allele, and you get two chances at it, so you could be a 4, 4, a 3, 4, 3, 3, 2, 2, 2, 4. The APOE4 allele in and of itself is not a bad thing, but the APOE4 allele depresses your, your latent antioxidant protection activity. So yes, you're at increase for Alzheimer's disease dramatically, but you're also at increased risk for, for a poor outcome if you have brain trauma. You're also at increased risk for having long-term seizures if you've had an early seizure in life. So it's a bad thing to carry. But what we've learned is that if you have the APOE4 gene, your antioxidant system doesn't work. You need higher levels of antioxidants.